This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for helping me afford to subject myself to awful films like this. Which, okay, I don't think that's completely fair. Believe it or not, I didn't actually hate this film at first. But that's probably because I only just saw it about two weeks ago, which gave everyone three months to spoil every last detail about this film on Twitter, including people who were DMing me questions about specific musical moments. So because I had the whole thing spoiled for me before I ever actually saw it, that meant that by the time I actually got around to this armpit of a film, I would already spent several hours rocking back and forth in a shower, eating a sleeve of Oreos trying to wrap my head around Ray being a Palpatine, or why Chewie gets a medal, or how everyone dies but then comes back for no reason, and how Finn is force sensitive or something, and how Leia dies because she's a mother or something. What is up with the mother hate in this series? Anyway, beyond the writing, this film has what I believe to be the worst soundtrack out of all nine films by a country mile. But before we get to that, if we're going to talk about this film, then we need to address the elephant in the room. About two and a half years ago, I made a video talking about the hidden secret message behind Rey's theme, which I made after I had come home from seeing The Last Jedi in theaters. And in that video, I tried to guess why John Williams decided to write Rey's theme in the way that he did. And what I got was this. And I realized something. Disney has no idea what they're doing. I'm serious. They don't have a plan for this trilogy. They're making this trilogy film by film. They're seeing how people react and then compensating based on the audience's reaction to their newest film. Part one, this is a bad film that is bad and not very good. Man oh man is this not a good movie. It is almost impressive how much this movie just kind of completely sucks. They somehow managed to upset everyone who liked The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. And those are people who hate each other. So you somehow brought the internet together. Congratulations. I guess Star Wars kind of finally fulfilled its own prophecy? Way to go. Bring balance to the Force, not leave it in darkness. But that's a really important distinction to make. People who liked The Last Jedi liked it because it cut ties to the original films. They liked that Rey wasn't a part of some magical family, and they liked that it wasn't about midi-chlorians, and that it was all about picking yourself up from your own bootstraps, making mistakes, learning, growing, trying to better yourself. They liked that even Luke Skywalker himself wasn't above making and learning from his mistakes, which this film completely retcons. Luke goes back to being the Jedi legend he always was. The only people who matter in the galaxy are the ones who are from the Skywalker and Palpatine families, which, if you get into the extended lore is technically just the Palpatine family, and everyone else is basically just a pawn in their lives. Now on the other side, people who really like the soft reboot with The Force Awakens, Rise of Skywalker kind of just craps all over the Anakin Skywalker Darth Vader story with some really weak contrivances. Oh, Palpatine was a clone, or one of these Palpatines was a clone, and Vader basically died for nothing, and everything that the Rebels did in the original trilogy didn't really mean anything, because they all just had to band together again to defeat the Emperor. Again, not to mention how much this film just went back and forth in the sequel trilogy. Trilogy. Kylo Ren has a helmet. Now he doesn't. Now he does again. Rey's got a family. No, she doesn't. Now she does again. He's got his Knights of Ren. No, he doesn't. Now he does again. It's... To be generous, a lot of really strange writing decisions, but there's a really great illustration of how this was a bad end to the sequel trilogy right here at the end. And believe it or not, I'm not talking about the Rey Skywalker thing. Indicates that she's going to stay there. And that, mm -hmm. to me, is absolutely depressing to the end of time. <laughs> but then the imagery, the imagery doesn't even support that either because, you know, that's not her droid, first of all. This is the What the Force podcast with Frank Lehman, who I've cited before as the Star Wars Music Yoda, who owns and operates the Star Wars Leitmotif catalog, which he updates all the time, and Christy Karu, composer for the Looking for Leia docuseries, along with Felicia Wisniewski and host Mary Claire Gold. And if you've got the time, you should definitely check them out because they go into way more detail about a lot of the musical problems I'm going to be talking about here. It's shocking how much this film didn't, like really go anywhere and had nothing really happen in it, all the while completely retconning, like, everything? Ray starts her journey on her own, or I guess she has BB-8, and she's in the desert, and she slides down sand, and she's confronted by old women, and at the end of her journey, she's in the exact same place. She's in the desert with BB-8, sliding down hills, being confronted by old women. The story basically went nowhere. But that lack of progression in the story, combined with really jarring writing, simultaneously tied John Williams' hands in terms of the score, while also needing to use the music in order to have the story to make sense in some places. They awkwardly took power away from Williams while also relying on him to tell the story. It's difficult to explain, but this film accidentally demonstrated how important a good score is in a film. Like, okay, we know that Finn's force sensitive, right? But think about it. How do we know that? How do we know he isn't just randomly getting an idea right here? Like, an instinct. 
feeling. A feeling? A force. How do you know? A feeling. We know that he's force sensitive and that he's using the force right here because we're hearing the force theme. Call off the ground invasion. Wait. The nav signal is coming from that command ship. That's our drop zone. This is the force theme and it's what plays whenever someone's using the force. Without this little piece of music, it just looks like Ray's inappropriately touching a worm. Or like Ray is inappropriately touching, well, you know where I'm going with this, okay. It helps us understand what's happening even when it isn't completely clear. Or like, okay, listen to this moment right here. It's actually genuinely really good. Ray, I know you. People know. keep telling me they know me. I'm afraid no one does. Ray is telling us that she feels like no one understands her, but we hear Kylo Ren's theme, implying that at this moment, she thinks that Kylo Ren is the only one who truly understands her, which is a great time to bring up Kylo Ren. His theme is actually the end of the Emperor's theme. It's this neat little connection that is conveniently validated by the Emperor randomly coming back, which, like, I honestly don't know how to feel about that, honestly. Because you see, like, if the Emperor was every voice in Kylo Ren's head, I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head. Then it actually makes sense for these two characters to have associative themes. So with all that in mind, let's look at the moment the TIE Fighters attack in the opening of the film. Locked on target. So now that we're in the groove, answer me this. Who is sending those TIE Fighters? And with that, we've got a problem. Part two, no work and all play. All the reward with no effort. So at this point in the film, we know that Kylo Ren has talked to the Emperor and is more or less teaming up with him. But this is before Kylo Ren confronts the First Order with the Emperor's request and talks about having a spy. At this point, the First Order is just sending out TIE Fighters trying to intercept the resistance message. But we hear the Emperor's theme. The music is almost out of order with the story. The First Order doesn't know about the Emperor yet, even though they're the ones sending the TIE Fighters. Or look right here, immediately following that moment when Poe and the rest are... <sighs> Lightspeed skipping. Tell me if you can figure out what the music is. It's super famous. Hold on! That's actually the Death Star being destroyed. So here's one of the insanely frustrating things that this film did. So what they're doing here is effectively hijacking a thematic moment in one of the past films and utilizing the emotional impact of that musical moment without going through the motions of how or why that music is so meaningful. They're stealing the emotional weight of the music and just plugging it into this film without earning that moment. It's all the spectacle, but no substance. Instead of earning these musical moments like you see with the original trilogy and even the prequels, we're just watching the music editors pull music out of old films. And it was the editors, not John Williams. Trust me, we're gonna get there. Oh, we're gonna get there. So what happens is that there's this finality to this scene. It makes this last jump feel oddly lethal, like they just warped into a black hole or something and died. Because the last time you heard this music, something exploded and the film was basically over. Which is super effective when you're watching this scene, even if you don't know why. Not because this is actually a tense moment, but because it sounds like the final moments before the Death Star explodes. Or let's go back to that TIE Fighter attack. You feel like it's coming from the Emperor, as in the Emperor commanded it, but he didn't. It still sounds super menacing, but it's fundamentally hijacking moments from the previous films by misleading the audience's ears. You think these are super dangerous TIE fighters when they aren't. You think these TIE fighters have intent from the Emperor when they don't. And like everything, it's kind of hard to explain how and why this is so damaging to the musical fabric that Williams has spent the better part of 40 years weaving. Like, look, there's this moment where Leia, like, goes to die. I'm not entirely sure what they were doing at this moment, and I'm not just talking about the music. Okay, so there's a difference between Leia's theme and Han and Leia's love theme. This is Leia's theme. I think she was a passenger on our last voyage, a person of some importance, as I believe. Our captain was attached to- Is there any to more to this recording? And we hear it here. Leia's saber. It was the last night of her training. But that's different from the Han and Leia love theme. <laughs> Hey, your worship, I'm only trying to help. Which is what we get right here when Leia goes to communicate with Kylo and then die for real. 
cousins? I don't even know how... La- okay, so maybe you could argue that she's trying to reach out to her son, Ben, who is different from Kylo Ren, and that Ben Solo, being the son of Han and Leia, would be connected to their love theme, but he isn't? Like, yes, okay, so like, Ben Solo, quote unquote, kills Kylo Ren, and then goes off to rescue Rey, and then we get this redeemed version of his theme. And again, I'm really stretching here, but Ben Solo's redeemed theme is just Kylo Ren's theme with a different harmony to try and make him sound heroic. And that's John Williams' own words. But it worked out where his evil theme morphs brilliantly into a kind of a hero theme by a change of harmonic support and so on. So I just, I can't imagine why you'd have the Han and Leia love theme play when Leia's like, all right, time to die, outside of reminding the audience about the older films and just trying to get them all nostalgic, which is just really weak. I mean, maybe, maybe this is supposed to be Leia summoning Han's force ghost and that this is actually Han Solo's force ghost being summoned by Leia, which required so much energy that it killed her, just like Luke in the last film. But then Kylo Ren calls him a memory, which is super misleading and then doesn't really make a lot of sense as to why he wouldn't be freaking out at seeing his dad's force ghost. Just what? Like, honestly, you can try and do mental gymnastics to try and justify why they put what music where they did. But the honest truth is it really feels like they're just throwing the music out there to try and make you feel things without earning it. It's just, it's so upsetting. But it's not as upsetting as, oh god, I don't think I can do it. Okay, we have to go here. Let's look at right here when Luke lifts up the X-Wing. What is this? Why are we doing this? This is Yoda's theme. Why are we playing Yoda's theme here? Why are we playing Yoda's theme right here? It just doesn't make any sense. But you see, it's not just Yoda's theme. Yoda lifts it and the Empire Strikes Back. Romero Belgar, the music editor, he said, oh, it should be exactly the music that we had for Yoda. And actually, JJ questioned it. He said, well, is that, should we be doing that right? And everybody said, oh, yes, it has to be. It's, you know, the fans will all know it. So we went back to the score of Empire Strikes Back to get those bars exactly out of them. That actual little central piece of taking the ship up is exactly as we had it before. Ah! Please tell me I'm not responsible for this, holy fu- Part three, thematic recontextualization. There's a huge problem with not only Star Wars, but scoring film franchises in general. Over time, as composers come onto the project, or as the stories in the films will take weird turns, like suddenly Luke and Leia being siblings instead of like, I guess, into each other, the musical themes are recontextualized. And although I've mentioned this a lot on my channel, there's really no better example of this than in Star Wars. This music right here, this is not the Force theme. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi's theme. Don't be afraid. Oh, don't worry, you'll be all right. But Ewan McGregor here dies in the first film, so when the unexpected sequel comes around, i.e. The Empire Strikes Back, whenever something Force-related happens, because the audience's only connection to the Force was through Mr. Hello There, there's now this recontextualized association with this music and the Force, instead of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hear me. This is no longer Obi-Wan's theme, this is now the Force theme. Not because the music itself changed, but because of how and where we saw it being used. If you look at the score to this film as a standalone film, this is a really strange moment. You could almost imply that Obi-Wan Kenobi is maybe even mind-tricking Luke into going on an adventure with him. But nowadays, with decades of hearing this as the Force theme, we all look back on it and see it as the Force guiding Luke to go on an adventure, when originally, this was just music that Lucas wanted right here with no real reason for it. I would argue that this is what makes this binary sunset scene so much more impactful nowadays than it might have been back in 77. Similarly, the Imperial March, which is the theme for the Empire, became associated with Darth Vader, who is just the personification of the Empire's power. But with Vader becoming such a popular character, along with the third film really exploring his relationship with Luke, his redemption, and then an entire prequel trilogy dedicated explicitly to his backstory, we now have a theme for a little kid from Tatooine that is directly related to the theme for the Empire. And that same thing happened to Luke's theme. Originally, it was both the main theme for Star Wars and Luke's theme because he was the hero of this story. 
And now we just all know it as the main theme for Star Wars, and Luke has somewhat lost his musical identity, just because the music kept playing at the start and end of six films where he didn't show up as the main character. So a lot of themes over the years have managed to develop new meanings as they've been used in different ways. So just cheaply throwing in familiar music whenever you want actually has the possibility of redefining some of these musical themes. At the very least, misusing these themes dilutes their original meaning. It's kind of like stormtroopers. Like originally they were really scary and you were under the impression that they could do damage. Too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. But now they're just a joke. That's not even a language. <laughs> you can undo and separate the leitmotif from its associative characterization. So when we hear Yoda's theme and Yoda isn't around, we gotta start asking ourselves, hmm, is this Yoda's theme or is this the X-Wing lift out of the water theme? Who knows? Who cares? Let's just make up our own rules, shall we? Really, why is this music here? Seriously, think about it. Why is this music here? right here. Why did they make the choice to play this music right here? It isn't telling us anything about the story that we need to know, it's just referencing an older movie, but it's also recontextualizing how and why that music exists during that scene. Or no, 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 okay, here's a better example. Check this out, right here. Yes, it's you, Leia. Any idea what music's being played right there? It's this really sentimental theme, it's one of my favorites, and it plays when Luke and Leia are talking about their past in Return of the Jedi. And this music does not appear very frequently in the Star Wars canon. It's extremely personal to Luke and Leia's relationship. The theme itself is actually constructed using elements from the melody of Luke's theme while employing harmony from Leia's theme. And it comes back in this really touching moment when Leia sees Luke for the last time before he dies. So you can see what makes these small personal moments so effective. Oh wait, nope, that's just a theme for when people talk. Where are you from, General? The gold system. Except no it isn't, because if you order the Rise of Skywalker Visual Dictionary on Amazon for $12.99 right now, you know that she is actually Lando Calrissian's daughter, because of course she is. So tell me, Disney. Tell me guys, is this or is this not the Luke and Leia theme? Oh wait, no, I know, I know. This is the family theme. Or no, no, I know. Because it's used when Luke and Leia discuss their background and realize that they're siblings, and then Luke and Leia see each other for the first time in years, this is when <laughs> and Lando reunite. This is actually the family reunion theme now, isn't it? That's the only way to have this make sense. You can see how these themes can lose their meaning when they aren't properly used. Right here when Ray's looking for the Horcrux or the flux capacitor, the, the thingy, I can't remember what it is. Crap, what was it? Wayfinder. When she's looking for the, finding the Wayfinder. When she's looking for the Wayfinder on the ruins of the Death Star, they're playing the music from when Vader died. See, back then they probably just saw this as a more sentimental version of the Imperial March for Vader's death. It's in the upper register, there's a little bit of harp thrown in there, but nowadays with all that development from the prequel trilogy, it doesn't just feel like a variation on the Imperial March anymore. At least to me, it feels like he's becoming Anakin again. At least for me, this moment now reminds me of that little boy from Tatooine. It makes the fact that Williams related Anakin's theme and Vader's theme that much more powerful. It actually adds to the incredible impact that this moment has when Anakin comes back. Williams retroactively improved a musical moment that he had already written 20 years before that, which is a breathtakingly amazing achievement in the already restrictive art of film scoring. It's like, yes, it's related to the Imperial March, and this is in an Imperial facility, and yes, this is literally the place where Vader died, but now we went from tracing a leitmotif through a six-film redemption arc to using this music to say, hey guys, remember the Death Star? Like, come on. And don't even get me started on Luke's theme. We hear it for Chewbacca when, I guess, he's not dead. He's alive. He must have been in a different transport. We gotta go get him. Your friend's on that sky trash? I guess he is. We get it for C-3PO because he's the hero, because of course... And my friends. <laughs> and we get it when, like, the Millennium Falcon does anything. All the studies! It shows up when Luke tells Rey about her destiny with Leia's saber. A thousand generations live in you now. But this is your fight. And in case you haven't picked it up, the main theme basically plays whenever anything from the original trilogy happens. Which just 
<sighs> okay. So like I've said a million times, this is originally Luke's theme, but after seeing it over all those title crawls and having to distance that theme from Luke specifically just to have it appear as the main theme for the Star Wars prequel films, this has just become the main theme to Star Wars. It plays over the title crawl of the film, it plays over the credits, I'm just repeating myself at this point. But, within the context of this film, it basically only plays when something or someone from the original trilogy does something. I can't believe I'm saying this, but they have actually worked to strip the main theme from Star Wars. I'm going to say that again. They've begun to strip the main theme for Star Wars of its unilateral meaning for all of Star Wars and just have it represent characters and things from the original trilogy. It just makes it feel like the movie's ending. Like there are just so many moments that strip the meaning from the music. Why do we hear the Imperial March when Palpatine lifts up the Star Destroyers? Why does it appear when the Star Destroyer appears to blow up Kijimi? What do these moments have to do with Darth Vader, let alone that little boy on Tatooine? And yes, there are plenty of moments where the Force theme is used really, really well. But why does it play when Lando Calrissian shows up? Is he force sensitive too? Neither were we. Luke, Han, Leia, me. Why does it play when Rose hugs Chewie? That doesn't make any sense. And I get that they're just trying to remake the binary sunset scene here, so fine, I'm gonna give you that. But then why doesn't it play when Rey is communicating with every Jedi ever? Be with me. Why not have Rey's theme play when she's literally standing against all the Sith? The whole point is that she has all the Jedi with her. She's the last Jedi. She's the whole point. Maybe that's when, I don't know, you can maybe use her theme. But when she's looking up into outer space and here's all the Jedi by using the Force, maybe... Just maybe, we can, I don't know, just a thought here. Maybe you could use the Force theme, huh? Mm, no, we can't play the Force theme when all the Force ghosts are talking to Rey, the last Jedi, but don't you worry. We'll play it when Finn's riding the horses on the surface of a Star Destroyer. Part four, three hours. On December 10th, 2019, Disney accidentally leaked the For Your Consideration edition of the score for The Rise of Skywalker. The For Your Consideration, or FYC score, is what film studios submit to the Academy for consideration for the Oscars. And the leak was a huge deal in the Star Wars fan community. Not just because the film hadn't come out yet, and the track titles have a tendency to give away the details for the story of a film, but because once the film was released, the fans realized that the score of the film and the For Your Consideration score were very, very different. On December 18th, 2019, the digital version of the official soundtrack, or the OST, for The Rise of Skywalker released. And once again, fans realized that some of the music in the OST was yet again somewhat different to the film's release. In August of 2019, Don Williams, John Williams' brother and a timpanist for all the Star Wars soundtracks, revealed that John Williams had written 135 minutes of music. Yet, by the end of the production process, it was revealed that Williams had written over three hours of music for this film. On January 15th, 2020, on the JW Fan Forums, an anonymous tipster leaked the cue list from a cut of the film that was dated for November 11th. The final date of recording was November 21st, 10 days later. These were the titles of the tracks that Williams would have recorded for that cut of the film. You'll notice that the cues are either out of order from what we see in the film, or just don't make any sense whatsoever. The one I'm personally interested in is titled Vader's Castle. Maybe that was in the original cut of the film and they removed it, or maybe it's just what Williams nicknamed this part of Exegol. Who knows? But with that in mind, I would like to play you the most upsetting part of this score. The time has come! I'm going to play that for you one more time. Rumor has it that they recorded a new version of Duel of Fates for this film. And it sounds like it was supposed to be right here. Instead, coincidentally, for the TV spot titled Duel, you can hear a new version of Duel of Fates. This will be the final word. I imagine that was in the original cut, and instead of just abandoning all that musical material, they recycled it for the commercial. Which might now be a good time to point out, has anyone noticed up until this point that there is no music from the prequel trilogy in this film? None. Whatsoever. 
it all comes from the original trilogy. I mean, I guess there's also no Rose theme either. Like, she had her own theme in the last film, but I guess, well... Oh, and did I mention that Mary's here? Anyway, when you look through the four-year consideration score, the official soundtrack release, and the leaked cue list, you can see what musical ideas Williams had that, without question, demonstrates how much better John Williams is than this film. You had all of these pieces to the puzzle and you got done and just were like, just cram them all in there. It's fine. It doesn't matter where they go. At least the picture's put together. I don't know what happened with the film. They might have had multiple versions that Williams had to try and accommodate for. I mean, I feel like it's obvious that they struggled with this film. Everyone hates it because they completely didn't plan it out. Which makes it all the more devastating that this is what they gave Williams for him to try and wrap up the biggest, longest running soundtrack of his life. Either way, it looks like Williams might have figured out how to paint outside the lines and maybe even write his own musical story. Who knows what secrets those three hours of music hold, and who knows what kind of thematic connections Williams tried to build. We could literally be looking at something the world of film scoring has never seen before. I'm sure it'd be worth checking out. You know, like, if you were some kind of multi-billion dollar corporation looking at your least profitable film from this sequel trilogy, and you were looking for some kind of merchandise that might boost that number a little bit, mind you, this would be something that you already have completely done, ready to go. All you'd have to do is push a button and you could release something that thousands and thousands of people would want and would spend a whole bunch of money on. It's up to you, Mr. Mouse, but I think the maestro deserves to have his music be heard. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible. The very special thank you to Alec Kulikowski, Alec Klinkert, Always Posh, Captain Casey, Christian, Clara Tan, Elise and Thomas Constantine, Google it, Hayden Elza, I want you to tell me if my fear is justified that no one will pay attention to me if I'm honest about my addiction to ice cream, Jacob Salas, Jordan Adams, Karen Rosenau, Kate J, Kim Coletta, Myron John Tataran, Noah Gray, Preylock, Rafael Martinez Salas, Rick Osborne, and Who Am I? I'd also like to thank everybody who requested that I talk about the rise of Skywalker. I feel like everybody knew that this was going to be in a video. It was an inevitability at this point. Um, if you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have your musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching. He's trying his hardest to be as bad as he can be, which is the only thing he's been doing. Can you change the theme or turn it upside down or something? And I think I initially said, well, no, I've never done that. And how do you do it? Like this! In fact, if you believe what Mark Richards on Film Music Notes has to say, that's how you wrote the victory theme for this film. Also, why is J.J. Abrams coming up with all the fun musical ideas? That's it. I'm convinced. This film is cursed.